in this um, this part of GUNF. Uh, we, we now have a panel on um, establishing regional networks. What are the benefits and challenges of setting up regional nicotine consumer group networks? Um, I'd like to start with Nancy. Nancy Sutthoff, who is um, our founder and co-director of Africa New Zealand, the first consumer only organisation for the use of electronic cigarettes and other SMP in New Zealand. Um, Nancy spoke this morning about, uh, in, in the Inco meeting earlier, about the um, importance of regional groups. So, did you want to start us off? Sure, I'll start. Um, I'm also the executive coordinator of CAFRA, which is the Coalition of Asia Pacific Harm Reduction Advocates. Um, that includes Thailand, Indonesia. India's not in part of us. No, no, no. India, well, we want India. India's not there yet. Hold on. So, we've got New Zealand, Australia. Uh, Indonesia, Thailand, we've got um, IQOS here in Hong Kong, we're working on getting Korea, we are working on getting Taiwan as well, and hopefully we can get Samart to come and join us, but Samart is part of us, he's just not officially part of us. Um, the idea for a regional network came about because one of the things that we noticed in New Zealand is when we started out, we came to the first GFN in 2016, we didn't know anybody. And it was a very strange situation because you're kind of sitting there out in the middle of nowhere going, well, who do I talk to and what do I do? And as I mentioned this morning, if you were in the consumer meeting, we were, I was lucky because NNA UK put, took us and put us under their wing and they helped us immensely. Um, and I always felt that, well, you know what, we need, to, we need to pay that forward. So that was kind of the, the reason why I was like pushing for us to have this. Now. When we talk about the benefits, and you probably think, well, what, what does New Zealand have similar to Thailand or to Indonesia? Um, one of the things in the Asia Pacific region, and it's a huge region, is that what happens in Oceania does affect the other side of Asia and vice versa. A lot of the medical professionals in Malaysia or Indonesia are trained either in Australia or in New Zealand. Um, there is the influence of trade packs and um, policy meetings. And so it was easier for us to have everybody together and then we have a continuum of experience. So you've got New Zealand, which really isn't, I would say they're probably the most experienced right now, but we're really not, haven't been around for more than three years. And then we have, we're bringing new people in. Um, we also include, one of the things that's interesting, and I don't know if you did this in your group, but we also have vendor advocates. Because of the political situation in Asia Pacific, we have vendor advocates who have more of a voice than consumers in their governments. And we wanted to be inclusive, and we wanted to have those people together. So you've got vendors, you've got consumers, um, you have people from uh, that use heat not burn, you've got people who are vapors, we're very inclusive. I think that's the, the main thing that I think is the benefit of a regional group is you have all these different people from all these different backgrounds with some similarity um, and you're able to share information, you're able to share experiences. There may be something, for example, in Hong Kong um, when the bans came down and Joe was like, oh my God, what do we do? Well, okay, New Zealand had the science. The Philippines had the science because the Philippines has, has been dealing with these issues with their own FDA. We share that information, we share those resources. We coordinate social media campaigns. If somebody needs a submission, everybody makes a submission. Um, it's a team, we're like a gang. I call us our own little dysfunctional gang. But the thing is, there's always somebody there to back you up. There's always somebody there to help you. And that is what I think is the benefit, the main benefit of a regional network. Um, in saying that though, one of the points I want to bring up is it doesn't have to be a regional network in terms of geographic area. I think the having a group together, um, a coalition let's just say, it could be based on snus, it could be based on heat not burn, it could be based on language. Everything is easier to deal with when you're dealing with it as a group as opposed to an individual and that's basically how I feel about it. What do you think? What do I think? What do you think? Well, we are just a recent alliance, so, so we still have uh, developing or we are working on creating associations in, in Latin America countries. Okay, so it's all Spanish language? And uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay. For Brazil. Yep. 
Do it. Do it. Speak. I, don't, I don't think Nancy wants to hold the microphone for you no, much longer. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to just, um, this is Thomas o, O'Gorman, um, a Mexican lawyer and uh, teaches corporation law and successions at um, Pan American University in Me Mex is that Mex Mexico City? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd just like to kick off just before you, but just picking up what Nancy said about different reasons for having different um, regional networks. I was talking to um, Roberto yesterday, and he was talking about perhaps there could be a group of Latin American countries, not necessarily regions, but by sort of culture and, and things like that. Is well, uh, first we, we have, we, uh, we all of the American countries, we speak Spanish, uh, but, but Brazil. So, so we have we face one one problem. We need information uh, in, uh, translated into Spanish. We lack the science. We, we don't have scientists working on on THR. There are there are no studies being made in Latin America. So we have to rely on on, on, on the studies that are published in English. And in most in, uh, uh, in in most cases, that information is not available for for all of us in in, in our in our language. Uh, what, what happens in Latin America is that we are facing the, 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 same, the same problems. Uh, I guess uh, we are standing where, where some other countries were five years ago. Uh, the governments are still saying that there is not enough information, that there are not independent studies, that there are toxic substances in, 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 in cigarettes paper. I just want to give you three examples. Uh, last year uh, in Mexico, there was an official media campaign made in TV, in radio, and in, in the internet where a lady doctor said plainly that that uh, electronic cigarette harmed and killed in the same way, exactly the same way as combustible tobacco does, with no accountability for such a lie. In Costa Rica, in a recent in a recent uh, interview, uh, a tobacco controller, an officer of of, of, of the public health, uh, it was something like Caja de Salud, uh, was complaining that vapors were attack attacking her and attacking the tobacco controllers because they were perpetrating uh, tabakism, which they are doing. And, and recently in, in Argentina there was uh, a, a confiscation of vaping equipment where the officers, uh, the officials, used hazmat suits. I mean, so, so they gave the idea that vaping is just as dangerous as plutonium or the Ebola virus. So, I, 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 the, the problem is that, that in, 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 in Latin America societies, people really believe, maybe as, as, as it's happening in the rest of the world, that vaping really kills. And, 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 and they are, they, the governments are not willing to accept tobacco harm reduction. Actually, there was a recent uh, positioning of, of, of the Cofer Police Authority in Mexico, which is kind of a sanitary regulator, like the FDA, in which it, 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 uh, they, they said that, that vaping was, was, to be, was to be regulated <laughs> just, just as, as tobacco. And, and, and uh, in a recent report from some NGOs, anti-tobacco NGOs, they just said that vaping should uh, receive the same treatment as tobacco and the, uh, the empower uh, regulations should be applied, and, 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 and literally they said that that uh, e-cigarettes should have uh, should be taxed in the same way as tobacco to prevent people from transitioning from the traditional product to the new product. So they are perpetuating tabakism, and we're facing the same the same problems. Uh, but we we need to, to form asso consumer associations in, in in all Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, in, in, in the, at this moment, we, we just have uh, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Spain, that, that has shared their experience with, with us, and, and Mexico. Uh, and we are just trying to organize ourselves. The, uh, the alliance was, was uh, Francisco Ordóñez from Colombia's idea. And what, what we are, are uh, facing is of that uh, all the Latin American countries are using almost the same arguments. So, so uh, we are in a moment where we are trying to, to gather information and to, to, to share this information with our members so they can go to their local authorities and give them uh, some, some idea of what is uh, tobacco harm reduction because our governments are just refusing it. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, my question to you is, 
Are you dealing with the same issues that we're dealing with in Asia Pacific, that the WHO is telling them what to do and they're accepting everything they say, lock, stock, and barrel, not questioning it? Yes, yes, I, I believe they're, they're using exactly the same, the same arguments. Okay. And they constantly uh, use the WHO recommendations of the 2014 uh, COP, uh, the recommendations to, 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 to ban e-cigarettes. Actually, in most Latin America, uh, distribution and commercialization of vaping equipment is, is forbidden, uh, if that's the case. In, in Mexico, it's, it's not regulated, the, the, the possession or, or, or the usage, so I can, I can legally use it, but uh, a vendor cannot legally sell it. Okay, okay thanks. Now, we move on to Joseph Maguero. Um, an avid tobacco harm reduction advocate, um, former director of Africa Tobacco Free Initiative. Um, and I know Joseph, uh, from anyone who's on Twitter, has had all sorts of uh, problems in Africa from people who uh, are not too nice. So um, uh, I'm glad he's here with us. So, you know. Well, uh, as I said, my name is uh, Joseph Maguero. I'm a chairman at Campaign for Safer Alternatives. We are uh, a group of about 14 advocates from different countries in Africa. So I'm, going, I'm just going to briefly speak on the challenges we face um, uh, in, in, in regards to pushing the harm reduction agenda. Uh, personally, I, I started, uh, the reason why I joined harm reduction, uh, in, Judy introduced me to harm reduction. <coughs> oh, Judy gives some right there. Right there, Judy. <laughs> I turned him. You, know, I oh, yeah, she, you corrupted uh, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I used to be. I've been a tobacco control advocate for about ten years. We worked under um, campaign for tobacco for kids, so they used to fund our organization over the years. Uh, I used to uh, basically my job was to do research and to, to to speak to smokers on a daily basis to collect statistics and ask them how they quit smoking. And uh, in my job, I found that for me. 60% of smokers I spoke to knew the dangers of tobacco, but they just didn't care. They kept on smoking. So I thought maybe I should look at these other, other products that are in the market, that are coming into the market, and, and see if it could work. And I started doing research on, 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 uh, on e-cigarettes, on smooths as well. And then I began to write articles in the newspapers about it independently, not for my organization. So once they found that out, uh, unfortunately I lost my job because of that, but we just kept doing what we do. So we formed this organization, but some of the challenges we face here is, um, you know WHO and, and Tobacco Free Kids, they, they decide what, uh, in, term, in matters of regulation, they normally just give governments this information that counters ours and, and that's how regulations are passed. So we're trying to counter that, but we, we, we do not, have like a, like a science like a science base or research that's been proven independent. We don't have any of that, and the one that we have, they say that it comes from basically um, British American tobacco. That's what they claim. So we don't have science or research that is proven uh, for a country, for countries in Africa. And yeah, but for me, the main challenge is 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 the, is the science part because if you if you go to a minister uh, of health and you're trying to tell them to, to allow vaping in, in a country like Uganda, for example, where it's illegal to vape, they need you to present science. And the only science we have at the moment is, is from the industry. So we, 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 it would be good if we had independent science. Whatever we have right now is just from uh, KSE's uh, uh, report that just came out last year. The other thing we don't have is training material because we have advocates, but they don't know enough about these products. They speak about products that they have never seen with their own eyes, you know. Like, snus is legal in all African countries, but it's not available in the market. So we just read about it on the internet and encourage people to use snus, but it's not snus. So there's no product. And the... the, the, the we can change that in the future. Yeah? <laughs> you, you are... Uh, uh, sorry. You are most... So you are mostly in English-speaking uh, African countries? Well, English and French. On French as well, because yeah. you're in French. I don't speak in French. No, no, I mean in French, or if you want anything. We, we have anything. Is it? I'll speak to you about that. <laughs> uh, you're talking about research or what? 
Are you talking about research or training uh, products? Oh, yeah. Anything? All right. So I'll just finish up also by saying that uh, advocacy, whether we like it or not, it, it, it normally takes a lot of money. Uh, myself, I farm. I, I, my profession, I, I do farm, but I find I'm always on the computer reading stuff. So most of what we do at the moment is voluntary. Uh, to keep our advocates motivated, I just, we normally just communicate on the phone and tell them, you just keep pushing, we'll, we'll find something small for you. But at the moment, there is zero funding. We, we, we have zero funding on our end. Well, tobacco control, they get millions every year. They have, the, they have their research, they've got funding. We, we don't have research per se, and we have zero funding. So it's, it's, really, a, it's really tough for us back in Africa. Yes, that's all I'll say for Okay, um, it's a short session the last one, so we go straight to Q&A if anyone's got any questions um, on regional networks. Any, anyone got any observations? We slayed them. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. KK from India. A very basic, uh, as a medical doctor, I want to understand. One is that why Internationally, we are not having a debate on changing the name from e-cigarette to vaping, pure vaping. Why still we, because in India I have done a survey of doctors, 90% of the doctors still don't know the difference between cigarette and vaping. They understand electronic cigarette means it's a combustible vaping. They say, when I asked these questions to the last 10 doctors, they said, electronic cigarette means that instead of matchstick, we are using an electronic device to combust the cigarette. That's what, that's one thing. Second thing is that when we talk about the Hippocratic Oath, we talk about the, uh, we talk about the UNESCO bioethics principles. We talk about two things, a beneficence and non beneficence And in uh, Hippocratic Oath, we also talk about first, do not harm. Therefore, we need to come out with an international consensus for the medical profession that harm reduction comes into the category of non beneficence That first, do not harm does not mean that I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot advise or I cannot tell people to take less harmful products. So these two are very important for medical profession. All right, can I address that? Yes, please. Um, Judy's sitting back there, she's like, because yeah. she knows, okay, we've been having this discussion for years about e-cigarette, the cigarette part. Yep. Okay, because when you hear that word automatically, what do you think of? You think of the muscle, you think cigarette, okay? We've tried for years to come up with different things. In New Zealand, we used ELV, e-liquid vaporizer. It didn't pick up because people didn't know what it was, so it just confounded the situation and made it that much more confusing. I do believe that since the GSTHR, we're using SNP more and more, safer nicotine products, because A, it doesn't mention cigarette, um, it doesn't mention tobacco, and it covers the entire toolkit. So that's something that's going to have to come organically as people use it, and instead of using e-cigarette, let's use SNP, and that's going to take some time. Um, part two of your question. Um, it's very difficult, and I, we have an MD on our board. It is very difficult to buck the trend when, you're, when you've been taught quit or die, you know this, okay? Um, your medical association is telling you, or your DHB is saying, no, quit or die. They don't want to accept something that's new because if it's new, they fear it, okay? That is something that's gonna have to come from the medical profession. Um, and it's going to be, it's, you, you're, it's, it's an uphill road. But the consumers will support you with that? Absolutely. I mean, we, we did it in New Zealand. We're doing it, we're trying to do it in Australia. But it, 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 the doctors themselves have to speak up, and a lot of the doctors don't want to do that because they don't want to deal with the ramifications of doing that. Does that answer? Well, and one more thing is that uh, when we talk about uh, regulatory mechanism, mm -hmm. people say that, that uh, this is not yet approved by the regulator, therefore doctors cannot prescribe, yep. but there is always a scope of off-label use, yep. and with the consent of the patient, yep. therefore any doctor anywhere in the world should be able to prescribe vaping as an alternative 
using the formula of off label with the patient's consent. Here's the thing. Here's the issue with that. We have this discussion in New Zealand as well. There is no liquid nicotine available to be prescribed. Okay, like Australia, you know, you have to get a script in order to be able to get the nicotine to be able to vape. Some countries that, that that is not even an option. I agree with you. I mean, off brand, you know, you give somebody, let's say, metropol all for you know anxiety, even though it's for high blood pressure. I get that. A lot of people get that. It depends on the country you're in, and it depends on the medical association, and it depends on how pharmaceutical or nicotine is provided in that country. But again, I, and I'm you know, not going to like this, but I'm throwing it back on you and in your country that you have to fight that battle with your medical association and your colleagues. Uh, actually, in, 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 in Mexico and my fellow Latin Americans, I'm sure they will back me, uh, there, there are a lot of doctors that think that vaporizers or electronic cigarettes are, are quite safer and a, and, a, and a good option for smokers, but they want they won't uh, go public about it. So they, 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 they real, they, they're really scared of the consequences of, of doing so. And, and another thing is that I, I don't uh, think that a doctor has to prescribe a vaporizer. He can recommend a, va a vaporizer because it is a consumer product. I mean, a, a doctor can tell me to eat carrots, and carrots are not a medicine. So a doctor can tell me to switch to a vaporizer without uh, turning the vaporizer into a medicine. Uh, I, I believe that, that doctors uh, ha have to, to do their job under the principle of primum non nocere. They have, they have to avoid damage. And, and by, by uh, keeping uh, smokers away from uh, safer alternatives, they are doing harm. Yeah. By, not, not, not by action, but, but by omission. And sometimes they don't have the choice, though, because, like, for example, in Thailand. Sorry. Sometimes they don't have a choice because, for example, in Thailand it's banned. What is a doctor to do? You're going to have to go on the black market to get it. Do no harm? Send somebody to the black market? You don't know what the product is? You don't know how safe it is? I don't know. At least in my country, if, I, if, if a drug is not available and it is not uh, regulated, then I, as a patient, I can import it. Nobody can stop me. We, we kind of get an off topic a little yeah, bit. We yeah, can, yeah. can we just cook it back to uh, uh, um, regional networks? Um, the gentleman over there. Uh, to my, uh, Thomas said uh, you can't um, translate with, uh, sorry, my English is bad, but no, it's good. Why is it? Okay, okay. I'll listen. Uh, es un poco para complementar lo que comentó uh, Tomás. In order to complement what I said. Uh, yo hablo con muchos grupos uh, de usuarios en América Latina y uno de los miedos que tienen los usuarios es que no tienen o no es eh, una guía en cada uno de esos países para construir o constituir una asociación. Uh, okay, what Francisco says is that he has talked with several uh, consumers in, in Latin American countries and, and the problem they, they face is that they lack uh, guidance in order to uh, incorporate or to constitute associations. <laughs> and, and I guess you will, well, you will also want to, to add that they, that they don't have the, the scientific information and the arguments in order to, to, to to, to debate uh, with, with authorities and with, with um, uh, medical bureaucracies. Entonces, debido a eso, digamos, hay muchas asociaciones, digamos, muchos grupos de usuarios que no pueden, digamos, liderar procesos de defensa del vapor y de reducción de los daños, precisamente porque no tienen un acompañamiento legal para poder mm -hmm. crear las asociaciones en cada uno de esos países, y es una necesidad realmente que debemos cubrir. Uh, and because of that, there are uh, consumer groups in Latin America that don't have the, the, the means uh, in, in order to incorporate these associations so they cannot have an entity fighting and doing advocacy activities in order to promote uh, THR. Eh, existen eh, realmente el, el, el grupo de vapers en, el, en, en Latinoamérica es bastante grande, por, por ejemplo México, Colombia, eh, Chile, Argentina es un número bastante considerable, hay otros países que buscan también digamos el apoyo para constituirse como asociación como por ejemplo Panamá, eh, Ecuador, eh, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brasil también está en un proceso para poderse constituir como asociación pero digamos necesitamos de parte digamos de las personas o las instituciones que pueden ayudarnos a que eso se dé. To do so. uh, can I, I put in a point then to the panelists here? Um, 
how do you think um, how do you think that position there could be helped? That situation could be helped by having regional groups to support each other in different countries. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all. Uh, Regarding uh, legal guidance, they, 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 they will need to, to find uh, local lawyers because uh, the regulations in order to incorporate associations uh, vary from country to country. But what, what at least we are, we are doing is not only supporting them with, 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 with our own experiences when, when, when they, they talk to us, but also sharing uh, uh, the information we have already translated into, into Spanish. Uh, Roberto Sussman has done a terrific job about it. And, and in our side, we have, I don't know, maybe 300, 400 pages, printed pages of, of information uh, regarding vaping and, uh, and, and, and vaping uh, health effects. Uh, but uh, what, what, what we can do is, uh, at least just for, for the time, is, is to, 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 to support them and, and to give them advice uh, of how they, they should uh, manage things and maybe get local funds, because one of the problems that as you already uh, listened, is that, that of course we lack, we, we really lack funds. Um, one of the things um, in Asia Pacific, like I said, there's a continuum of experience, but, and the information, and, and we have a website, and it has to automatically translate into about five or six languages, because we've got five or six languages. Um, the sharing of the information is one thing. One of the main things that we do when a new group comes on is we try to explain to them how to be an advocate, how to effectively be an advocate, how to think like an advocate, how to act like an advocate. Because there is a difference between advocacy and activism. And they do work hand in hand, but you need to know which one to use at what time and in what situation. May I just say something? Yes. yes. I think in, in co have been here the longest, yeah? for consumer organization. It's the global group, yeah. yeah INCO. I, I thought INCO should be the one to maybe train some of these advocates and provide them with information on the website, which I normally try to refer from INCO, but some, some they don't have any, like, any statistics or anything for African countries, I would say, so I don't know. All right, may I? Okay, um, the thing with INCO is if um, you're a member, there is a small grants program, and part of that small grants program, which all the members are going to get an outline of, is there are sections in there for developing member organizations. There are sections in there for education and to teach. So everything you're saying is in the pipeline, but again, it's a money issue. Okay, we've got a question here. Yes, um, my name is Angeles. I am in Spain. Maybe um, I want to ask um, Thomas or Francisco, maybe, as Nancy said, professional advocates being there, maybe scientific congress, for example, trying to bring politicians, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, people, yeah, well, it's the same thing we did in, in Spain, more or less. I think eventually we will, we will have them. Uh, it's, uh, First, uh, a fund problem, and, and the second, we, we don't have sci uh, local scientists with knowledge and, and, and willing to support uh, THR and, and, and safer nicotine products. So, e if we want a, a congress, we will have we will have to to bring people from Europe mostly. Angeles, in Asia Pacific, we usually bring Constantinos over. Now, everybody who knows Constantinos knows Constantinos. <laughs> Part of what <laughs> we love Constantinos. Part of what I've been involved in with CAFRA is to try to find local advisors, local people, because as you know, you know, having somebody who speaks your language, is knows your culture, understands, it makes it much more relatable. Carmen City, you're going to like this. Um, and that's something that ACO should be helping to develop with these organizations as they're developing these organizations. That's kind of in the plan. Yes? Yes, but in Spain, for instance, when we had the summit, yeah. after that, we got many Spanish scientists supporting THR. And we created, well, the platform, a scientific platform was created. So that was really strong in Spain because after that summit, we got like lots of doctors that first said that they couldn't support THR because that would be controversial for their own businesses. Now, for their. 
I'm going to throw this one out at you, and then we'll get to Charles because he's like yeah, chomping yeah. at the bit to ask this question. Yes. Oh, I'm All sorry. Right. Uh, let me. <coughs> you have the the advisors now and the scientists and the doctors that speak Spanish, and I know you're helping Latin America. Contact them and see if they've got contacts, and then that's how the networking and yeah. Okay, right. yeah, we'll move on to the question here and then come to Charles after that. That's a question. So I want to share some experience with them of with the machine regional network. May, may I? Yeah, may absolutely. I share? All right, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Sam Shamsho. I'm from Malaysia. I'm a professor in one of the universities. Mm -hmm. uh, my field is in occupational safety and health. So what we do in Malaysia, and uh, as uh, most of my colleagues know, that Malaysia is not that easy for, I mean, the, the Minister of Health is, it's like in Thailand, you know, total, yeah, yeah, yeah. total, total ban of uh, harm reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do now, within this year, is that uh, we are focusing on a smaller focus of group, which is the workers. In my field, I, I work with a lot of workers as a safety and health practitioner. So it's easier for, for us uh, to, to educate, uh, educate uh, workers because in, in our field, we have one term called as hierarchy of controls. So when we, when we uh, advocate, when we preach to occupational health doctors or occupational health nurse, talking about hierarchy of control, either elimination, substitution, isolation, so it's easier for them to understand. So we don't really go to the Ministry of Health and then to advocate, we go to the Ministry of Labor, to the Ministry of Human Resource. Yeah. And it is easier because all of them understand what is switching, what is harm reduction all about. Right. So within, within our, 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 our field. So I think one of the way that we, has, we should do, that we need to refocus, is that try to look within other, the, the focus. We can go, because workers are the main workers, especially in, in our country, is the main people that smoke. So they are the, the biggest compared to only one or two percent of uh, adolescents and uh, also those that retire. So they are the main bar. So then that's that's how we try to do. We try to uh, we try to educate them what is the the, the the thing about smoking, the conventional cigarette, and tell them in a way that it is as you mentioned, you need to have money to be localized people. So to give the idea on the bad thing about smoking and what is nicotine and what is harm reduction if they cannot quit smoking. So that's what we are trying to do in Malaysia. Just yeah, I, I mean, we did that in New Zealand with the um, smoking cessation nurses. Yeah. We educated them and then they spread it out <coughs> and then kind of spider webs. So, exactly. Can I, can I ask um, uh, Joseph what, what was just said there? What is, is your experience in Africa like that or um, what he was saying about Malaysia? Um, well, getting across the idea of harm reduction, you've had a lot of trouble with that in Africa, yeah. haven't you? I mean, how would you think about going about that in a, in a region like Africa? How do you get harm reduction on the agenda of politicians? Basically, you approach them. Yeah. We, if we organise ourselves into a, a group um, uh, and get an organisation, personally, I, I write them directly. I visit some of them. But for now, it's just write them directly. Just contact them and then give them the idea first and then go to the people and just keep doing it. Yeah. Charles? Okay, uh, Charles Gardner. Um, so I have one process question and, and one question that may be just too much of a can of worms. But, okay, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll go with the go first there. one. So uh, you we're, we're looking at one regional network here that is fully formed mm -hmm. and operating, and two that are that are in development. Mm -hmm. And the the question I have is, how do these regional networks, which I think are fantastic, interact with Inca? So how, how where do they sit? Is there kind of an organogram where you have Inca Secretariat and you have member organizations, and then you have these networks in between and... No, um, as you know, I mean, by now, you guys don't, so I'll explain it. Um, the first regional network was Asia Pacific, mm -hmm. and I was the regional coordinator, okay, in developing this. Um, I promoted, and everybody agrees now, that yes, we need to have regionals, regional groups. It is, in the, it is in the plan to have regional groups. It is in the plan to have regional coordinators. My justification for this to INCO was it would make INCO's job a lot easier instead of having, you have one person, it's almost like creating a middle management, but not. You'd have one person that you can contact about anything that's happening in that region instead of having to try to contact 20 people. 
So does that answer your question? It is in there and it will be implemented. Uh, I want to add, in, in, in our case, uh, Spain's support has been fundamental mm -hmm. because Angeles has been worked very closely with Francisco uh, to get uh, the formation of, of local associations. So, so Angeles is, is uh, uh, Latin America's uh, bridge to, to INCO. Yeah. Okay, so That's is cool. each regional network a member of INCO then? Each of the organizations in if they're a consumer organization, like in Asia Pacific, in CAFRA, and it, yeah, give me this. If it's a consumer-only organization, they are a full member of INCO. We have two organizations in CAFRA that are not members of INCO. The reason, one, is a vendor hybrid organization. And at the time, there was not a mechanism to accept that. INCO is working on that. The other is we have a group in Hong Kong, I quote, which is basically a Facebook group, so they're not even an organization yet. So this kind of all ties into as INCO grows and, and, and adjusts to what they're dealing with, the regions will grow and adjust. But the thing about the regions is the regions have the opportunity of being more inclusive. So you can be a member of CAFRA. doesn't mean you have to be a member of INCO. But if you're a member of INCO, you can be a member of CAFRA. And I hope that just made sense. Okay, we've got a question over here, and then Judy, it's, and then we might have to It's another question. I'm from Chile. just want to say that Antilles from INCO have been so important in forming yeah. our association with Colombia. The regions have been uh, really been supported, helping us, and without them, yeah. it's impossible to do what we have done in Chile. So I'm really, really grateful for Angeles and for Inco for, and Francisco from Colombia that have helped us always. It's really, really important for us the, the, this regional way to make us a group. Yes, I agree. I, I, I want to have one, just one idea uh, because I believe it's a problem that, that is common for Africa and Latin America. We are mostly low-income countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently, these devices are, are, are expensive, so uh, we, we eventually we will face a problem that uh, we, we will have to find a way to make THR available mm -hmm. for, for lower income people because, uh, I mean, these things really cost, I mean, uh, uh, the, the problem maybe will be taxation if, if, if if local governments want to, to, to establish taxes to, to, to vaping. Yeah, I know, snus is, a, is an option, but uh, uh, no one in Latin America knows what is it. We, we always have to explain people that snus is a species or a form of oral tobacco. They don't have any idea, I'm sorry. Uh, they are, they're, mo they're, mo they're more they're more familiar, familiar with, uh, with vaping and with, with cigarettes. Okay, okay. Um, and final question from Judy. Um, yeah, well, it's not a question, just a thing which I'm sure Nancy will agree. Uh, something, Judy Gibson from INCO, um, <clears throat> that another thing as we, as, as, in, as INCO grows in a sense, because we sort of got so far now we're spreading our wings, hopefully with a bit of money, uh, uh, um, is that we are intending to produce a mentoring program so that when new members, and by saying members, in other words, they may not even be an organisation. They are embryonic, if you like, um, possibly fetal. Um, but the idea is that we, there will be a mentoring uh, thing, and it won't be just members of INCO, when I say members like the board or the secretariat, but actually, for instance, if um, you know the, the Chile have, have come on or whatever it is, but those areas will then take over the mentorships in the region, so that that's regional as well, but it's slightly different. And they will start as associate members now, so they will have a plan of say maybe one or two years, and they will go through they will go through those stages. Now I'm hoping that that will really help. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Great. As it wasn't a question, um, uh, I don't think we need an answer. So. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Last question. I forgot over there. Canada. You've spoken about regional organizations. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about organizations which are based on cultural similarities as well as regional ones? 
All right. Um, one of the things that has been discussed, and Bob knows about this, that's why he's bringing it up, because he wanted me to say it, um, <laughs> is we were discussing about setting up a group um, of Commonwealth countries, because Commonwealth countries operate under the same governmental system. So, for example, I'm on the advisory board of THRA in Canada, and because they're also a Commonwealth country, I understand how things work, whereas if you were to ask their next door neighbor in the United States, they'd be like, we have no idea how that works. Um, I think that this concept can expand not just to be regional in terms of geographical regions, but also interests um, and cultures and government systems and so on and so forth. So, yes. I believe having Spain on board give, makes HL probably uh, accomplish both aspects. We are a regional organization, but, but uh, also we are an Hispanic Latin American uh, organization as we share the same language, uh, of course, but Brazil. But, but, but Brazil is part of the region, so, so I, I guess we are uh, uh, covering both aspects, you, you, you said. Okay, um, I think that's all we've got time for, really. Um, but I'd like to thank the panel, Nancy, Thomas, and Joseph. Could you give them a round of applause? Thanks. Um, but we're going to move straight on to the next ones with Harry and Atakan, if they want to come up.